lecture today, I just want to sort of make the point that up until now, we've sort of been working on how to how to solve processes, basically. But starting with today's lecture and then moving forward, we're going to be chaining these processes together, whether they're open processes or closed processes, to do these thermodynamic cycles. So what I've done is here, we still will still have all the lecture content week to week, but I've also made a section here in the content in my courses where what we're going to do is we're going to have cycle analysis example videos. So when you're studying for exams or when you're studying for a midterm or something, if you want to, today we're going to talk about Rankine cycles. So kind of a shorter version of today's lecture that just goes through the example is in here. So under this part in the content that's called cycle analysis example videos, it's exactly just that broken down by cycle. So we have Rankine cycles. So this is kind of like coal power plants or nuclear power plants, internal combustion engines. So spark ignition and compression engine or auto and diesel cycles, uh, the Brayton cycle. So this is kind of natural gas power plants but also turbojets run on Brayton cycles. And then finally, we'll finish off the course looking at some thermal management cycles, talking about how we analyze heat pumps and uh, refrigeration systems. So I just wanted to let you know that that's there in the content. You're certainly welcome to look ahead if you like. The way that I try to do it, and actually this first video that's here, um, my goal is for all of us to be thinking about all of these cycle analysis problems really as the same problem where we'll ask, what's the energy benefit? So why are we running the cycle? What's the energy cost? How do I use the first law? So what assumptions should I make? And then what's the fluid? And we know that what's the fluid question is kind of a two part question. The first, is it water or something else that's bouncing back and, and forth across the vapor dome? And the second option is, is it an ideal gas? And if it's an ideal gas, then we need to know whether or not it's constant or variable specific heat. And if it's water, we need to know what phase it is. So all of these cycles have their own kind of unique answers or combination of answers to those questions. But ultimately, I think the methodology here is very similar for all of these, all of these cycles. So with that, did anybody have questions before we got started here in the lecture? Okay, well, like we've been saying, we've been trying to get an understanding of processes, right? And we talked about kind of this special case of a reversible process. And a reversible process is a process where the, you know, it's like the idea of you pull the pendulum back, you let go of the pendulum, and it comes all the way back up instead of only almost all the way back up, right? So it's, it's a process that has no losses, no irreversibilities. And the thing that we know about these reversible processes is that they don't happen. They're not real. But being able to describe these ideal processes can still help us to understand the universe, right? So it's kind of an imperfect model. But as engineers, a lot of times our job is to either design or improve processes while having an imperfect understanding of how the universe works. In ideal processes, when we looked at the second law, we remember that these ideal processes have zero entropy generation. So if I want to find out the very best that our process can perform, or at least the limit of where our process can, to, can perform to, it would be by setting this entropy generation term to zero. Real processes, of course, have some positive entropy that's generated. Now, remember, we talked about how this is the entropy generated in the whole universe. Right? So it's okay for a piece of mass, like the steam that gets condensed in a condenser, it's okay for its specific entropy to decrease, but we have to recognize that as it's rejecting that heat to the rest of the surroundings, it's increasing the entropy of those surroundings by more than the entropy is decreased in the steam. So the entropy generation rate of the universe always has to be positive. We talked about um, Carnot engines, right? Remember, Carnot is kind of like engineering code for ideal engines. So in an, in a, this, here this says in an ideal engine, but really this equation 
works for any engine that's at steady state, any heat engine that's at steady state. We found this from the first law by zooming the first law out and looking at that Rankine cycle, which was kind of a, a combination of a turbine, a condenser, a boiler, and a pump. And we said, well, we can do that. We can look at the net work and we can then, we know that the net work is equal to the net heat, which is the heat in minus the heat out if we treat everything as an absolute value. And then we can define thermal efficiency, which is the energy benefit divided by the energy cost. So the net work over the heat in, in this case, because the purpose of this heat engine, right, we're, um, we're trying to produce mechanical power in the form of a spinning shaft on that turbine. And the price we pay for that is we have to add heat. Oftentimes when we add heat, we do that by uh, burning some kind of a fossil fuel. But we're getting better, right? We're, we're sort of uh, trying to either transition from fossil fuels like coal to fossil fuels like natural gas that have fewer emissions. And we're trying to do better with renewables, although that's, um, you know, we could argue maybe that the pace there is slower than we'd like. But if, from a thermodynamic perspective, when we have this equation for thermal efficiency, we have this ratio of heat transfer rates. And if we go from the real to the ideal case, we can then have this ratio of heat transfer rates be represented as a ratio of temperatures. Because these are not delta T terms, we have to use absolute temperature. So it has to be in Kelvin or in Rankine. We also talked about refrigerators and heat pumps, they're sort of similar, and they also have these ideal versions of these equations that we got from ratios of heat transfers, and we just put those as ratios of temperatures. Again, I'm going to say it's always best when you're doing these kind of Carnot calculations, whether it's a coefficient of performance, like what's shown here, or it's a thermal efficiency, which was that fancy N or eta, it's safest to use Calvin or Rankine. Here, I recognize that in the denominator, it doesn't matter if you use Kelvin or Celsius, as long as it's the same in both terms, but it's just safer to always use absolute temperatures in these calculations. So what we're going to go through today is an example of a Carnot heat engine. And the type of Carnot heat engine we're going to use is called a Rankine cycle. So this Rankine cycle is made up of a couple of different components. So one is a turbine. Right, the purpose of the turbine, we put in steam that's at high pressure and high enthalpy, and it expands over our, the blades in our turbine, and that spins this shaft. And then the whole rest of this cycle, the purpose is just to get back to the inlet of the turbine, right? Because the purpose of that turbine is to generate power, and that's also the purpose of the whole process. So really what we're trying to do is get here, get back to that inlet to the turbine so we can run that whole process. To do that, we take this steam at lower pressure, or maybe it's some uh, high quality fluid, right? So maybe it's some saturated vapor, or saturated liquid mixture, and we condense it. We make it all liquid. And the reason that we do that is we want to generate net power in this cycle. So the turbine produces a fair amount of power, but the pump consumes power. So we kind of want to minimize the amount of pump amount of pump power that we have. And it turns out that it takes a lot less power to increase the pressure of a liquid because it's incompressible than it does to increase the pressure of a vapor. So if here we had a vapor and we just tried to go directly back to here, then we'd end up using more power than we got out of the turbine. So that wouldn't be a very useful engine because it would have to consume power. So then we increase the pressure of this liquid, but now it's at the right pressure but it's a liquid and we want steam. So then we have to add heat, right? And this is, you know, sometimes we could get this heat in a Rankine cycle from uh, burning coal, but sometimes we get it from running a nuclear reaction. So in this example, we're given some information. We're told that the inlet temperature to the turbine is 300 degrees Celsius and the quality is one. So this is a saturated vapor at 300 degrees Celsius. At the outlet of the turbine, first we're, here we, we note this state is not 2, but 2s. When we have 2s, what that means is it's implying that this is the isentropic outlet. The outlet 
that would be from our turbine if that process was isentropic. So 2S tells us something, right? Particularly that this process is isentropic, but we also know the temperature is 10 degrees. At state three, right, as we go through this condenser, so we're probably still under the vapor dome here, we get to a point where the temperature is still 10 degrees, but we don't know anything else about state three here. We know enough about state four to fix this state because we have two independent intensive properties. One is that we know the temperature is 300 degrees. The other is that we know the quality is zero. So that's the information that we're given. And we're going to try to go through this cycle and figure out what the thermal efficiency is. So we want to find the thermal efficiency of this cycle. But then we want to compare that to the ideal thermal efficiency or the Carnot thermal efficiency. So just looking at my state table, this is one of the reasons I really like to make these state tables, because I know to fix states, I need two independent intensive properties. So just looking at this state table, it kind of tells me where I should start, because there are two states where I know two things about the process or about the state, right? So there's two states where I don't know enough information to fix, at least not yet, right? So that's one of the benefits of making this state table. So at state one, I know that the temperature is 300 degrees, and I know that the quality is one. So this means I can look up a two phase table where temperature is in the leftmost column. I, I, can't, I can never remember if that state, uh, if that's table two or table three in the, uh, in the textbook. But uh, we look at the right one here, the one with, that has temperature all the way on the left, right? And we're looking at Hg because that's the enthalpy, the specific enthalpy, when the quality is one. We can also on our state table, notice here that I have a column for the specific entropy. And maybe you understand why we have this now, but if you don't, I think it'll become apparent pretty soon. The good news here is that there's no interpolation required. So these are just straight lookups. So here I can see that if I have a temperature of water that's 300 degrees and my water is boiling, I know that the pressure has to be 8.581 megapascals. Hg, because the quality is 1, is 2,749 kilojoules per kilogram. And Sg is 5.7045 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. So now I fixed my first state. That's pretty good, right? The next thing that I want to do is fix another state. So the next easiest state to fix here is state four, because again, at state four, I have two independent intensive properties. The nice thing is I'm still under the vapor dome and I'm still at the same temperature. So really I'm looking at the same row on the table. It's just now, instead of looking at HG, I'm looking at HF and SF. So if I just look at you know, a column or two over, I can get this information, the pressure here, is still the same, right? So this is now uh, going into the boiler. The pressure is still the same, but this is all liquid instead of all vapor. The enthalpy is much lower. The specific enthalpy is much lower, right? That's why it, you have to put a bunch of energy into boil water, right? You all know that because if you made uh, macaroni and cheese, right, it takes a while for that water to boil. And we know that the entropy, the specific entropy is lower here too. So this is good. I've picked off the two states where I knew, where I had two independent intensive properties. But it's like, what do I do next, right? So now I'm going to use the fact that some of these processes are isentropic, right? So here I can look at, I'm going to draw the TS diagram, right? So this is um, the TS diagram for any Rankine cycle. Although these points where we come into the boiler and where we come out of the turbine might be different, right? But generally, if I'm drawing a TS diagram for a Rankine cycle, I first, I need to have a vapor dome. If I'm fixing states and I have something like water or a refrigerant that's close to this two-phase envelope, right? That's close to the vapor dome, then we have to use, we have to draw the vapor dome when we do the TS diagram. I know something about state 4S that it's a saturated liquid. So I'm going to draw a constant pressure line here. 
right? And it's constant pressure. So this is just a sketch. Who knows? It might not be in the right place, but it's good enough for my sketch, hopefully. I know 4S happens at a quality of zero, and I know state one happens at a quality of one. So I know where those two things are, and I go clear from the left-hand side of the vapor dome to the right-hand side of the vapor dome. Now, I've said that my turbine is an isentropic turbine, right? Now, the reason that we introduced this idea of a temperature versus specific entropy curve is so that when I have ideal pumps and turbines, they're isentropic, those are vertical lines on this TS diagram. So in this case, I'm assuming that my pump and my turbine are both isentropic. So here, I'm gonna go vertically down till I get to this lower pressure, right? Or I think they gave us maybe a temperature. I can't remember what was on the, the state table, right? But I go down till I reach this condenser inlet. And then I come through the condenser, moving left, right? Because a condenser is condensing things which means that the quality is getting lower, right? Because the quality tells me what's the mass fraction of vapor. So if I'm condensing something, then I have less vapor, right? So I'm moving from the right to the left till I get to state three. Now I'm also assuming that this pump is an isentropic pump. So that means that the pump process must go vertically up from state three to state four S. So these have to be aligned vertically as well. So this is what my TS diagram looks like for this Rankine cycle. I also sometimes when I draw these, I like to remind myself what's going on in each process. So the main benefit of the turbine is that it's producing power, right? That's the reason that we run it. You can even see in this, uh, in this picture, it shows that we're producing power. When we look at this, um, at this condenser, heat is leaving, right? So we're rejecting heat. So I draw this squiggly line. So I'm using straight lines for power and squiggly lines for heat transfer, right? So heat transfer is leaving the system. So I have this squiggly line that's leaving my cycle, which is in here. My pump, it's consuming power. So power is going into the system. Work in is negative, right? So we expect this number to be negative. So here I draw this in. And then in my boiler, I'm adding heat. So heat is going into the system. So now on my TS diagram, I've demonstrated that I understand where these points are probably going to be. So that's going to help me, you know, figure out which table to look at. I've demonstrated that I understand what's going on in each process. And hopefully that'll help me to kind of think about, okay, what's the thermal efficiency supposed to be? Right? So I think this is on the equation sheet too, but the thermal efficiency is going to be the same basic definition in words as all of our different characterization parameters. So sometimes we'll talk about coefficients of performance if we're talking about thermal management systems like refrigerators or heat pumps. But if we're talking about any of these cycles, I want to define the characteristic parameter as desired energy effect, or sometimes I'll say energy benefit, divided by the energy cost. So the benefit of running one of these heat engines is to produce power. That's the whole reason we've designed and you know, presumably constructed this device. The cost is that we have to add heat, sometimes by doing things like burning fossil fuels, right? So this is going to be our thermal efficiency. Now this net power, the textbook will tell you that it's turbine power minus pump power. But then it also tells you that turbine power is going to be m dot times h in minus h out. And pump power is m dot times h out minus h in. Because they're just sort of taking absolute values everywhere. But they don't really tell you that. So instead, I'm going to tell you anytime you're finding your net power, add up all the power components. Take the turbine power, add the pump power. If you have multiple turbines, you can add up multiple turbines, multiple pumps, you add up multiple pumps. Right, And you let the first law figure out what the sign is going to be. All of these terms that are power terms are going to be m dot times h in minus h out. And you let the first law worry about the signs. Now the denominator, This sometimes people mess this up because we know it's net power on the top. So sometimes people want to put net heat transfer rate on the bottom. And if you do that, then you'll always get that the thermal efficiency is 1 as long as your system is at steady state. 
and that's um that's not really very beneficial if every heat engine you ever look at has 100 percent efficiency because as an engineers right our job is oftentimes how do we make this system better and it doesn't look like you can if you're always getting efficiencies of 100 percent so here really what we're asking is how much of this heat that we put in gets turned into power that I can sort of export onto the grid. In this case, we've got a symbolic equation, but I don't know the thermal efficiency, I don't know the turbine power, I don't know the pump power, and I don't know the boiler heat in, right? So it's great that I got an equation, but I don't know anything about what's going on inside, right? So first, let's look at the network. So the network is going to be about finding the power that's associated with both the turbine and the pump. So in order to do that, I start with my first law. I'm going to encourage you to always start with the first law, even though you probably, you may even by this point, have an intuitive understanding of what you think the turbine and pump power equation is going to be. I could give you a question on a test where there's some heat that's wasted from the turbine. So there's, if there's heat loss from the turbine, and if I do that and you only know that W dot is equal to M dot times H in minus H out, um, you're going to be in trouble because that won't be the right equation, right? So we start from the first law and we make assumptions. And when you make these assumptions, I can see that you know what you're doing, right? It's an opportunity for you to tell me that you understand what's going on, right? So I know sometimes it takes a little bit of extra time. You got to write out this whole equation and it's reasonably long right? But it helps you demonstrate your understanding, right? So here we're going to assume that we're at steady state, that there's no change in potential energy or kinetic energy, that our turbine and our pump are both well insulated, or if we're looking for the fancy engineering term, that they're adiabatic, which means perfectly insulated. And if I get that, and I assume that there's one inlet and one outlet, which I can see here in my pictures, the turbine's got one inlet and one outlet, this pump has one inlet and one outlet. Then what happens is the mass flow rates in and out must be the same if we're at steady state with one inlet and one outlet. And we see that the power for both of these components is M dot times H in minus H out. For the turbine, the inlet is at state one. So there's going to be the mass flow rate of the turbine times H1 minus H2. That's the outlet. And for the pump, we get M dot of the pump times H3 minus H4. So now I've got this equation for my thermal efficiency, but now I have expressions for the turbine power and the pump power. So I can put those both into the numerator here. Now I'm going to do the same kind of first law analysis, but this time on the boiler. So I go back to my um, first law. Now this is always a bit tricky when we do heat exchangers because we have to pick what half of the heat exchanger we want to deal with. Now, in this case, we're not given any information about how this heat is coming in. So instead, we'll just deal with the hot side. But that's good because in heat exchangers, typically, if you're trying to find Q dot, you'll just do the first law on half of the heat exchanger. And if you're trying to find uh, some mass flow rate, you'll typically try to do conservation of energy on the entire heat exchanger. So here on the hot side, or just on the one side of the boiler, we're going to assume that it's at steady state, that it's passive, that there's no spinning fans or spinning blades inside of our boiler. We're going to assume that uh, potential energy and kinetic energy are both negligible. And we're going to assume that it's one inlet and one outlet. And when we do that, we're going to see that Q dot is equal to M dot times H out minus H in. I can look here and I can see that my outlet state is state one. That's also the inlet to the turbine because remember all these things are chained together. And the inlet state is state four. So here I have M dot of the boiler multiplied by H1 minus H4. So I put that into my expression, right? So I know Q dot boiler, that goes in here. So now it's a little bit magical, right? But all of these things are... Um, you know, I can factor out the mass flow rate from the top in the numerator and from the denominator. I know H1, I know H4, because I fixed those two states because it was pretty straightforward, right? I, it was from the same table, 
right? But I don't know the mass flow rate of the turbine. I don't know H2. I don't know the mass flow rate of the pump. I don't know uh, H3. And I don't know the mass flow rate of the boiler. Now, I guess I tried to tell you this already because I forgot about how my slides were animated. But the cool thing here is that all these mass flow rates are going to drop out. So we can do conservation of mass for any one of these components in my system. The assumptions we'll make is that they're all at steady state. They're all one inlet and one outlet. So for each one of these components, the mass flow rate in is equal to the mass flow rate out. But the mass flow rate into the turbine is also the mass flow rate out of the boiler. So if here, the mass flow rate out of the boiler is equal to the mass flow rate into the boiler, right? That means the boiler mass flow rate is the same as the turbine mass flow rate. And that's true for all of these components. So in this problem, because we don't split the mass anywhere in the system, all of these systems are one inlet and one outlet. And we've assumed that the system is at steady state. So that means that there aren't separate mass flow rates. There's only one mass flow rate in this problem. And that's cool because I can factor it out of the numerator and the denominator so that that all drops out and I get this equation in this case for this four-part Rankine cycle. That H1 minus H2 plus H3 minus H4 divided by H1 minus H4 is the thermal efficiency. Right? So in this case, our system is the ideal cycle, but this equation would actually work for a real cycle too, provided I could fix state two and state three. Right? So now I know H1, I know H4, but I need to know H2 and I need to know H3. So we've gone through this process and now we have one equation with three unknowns. But this is kind of always where we want to be in thermodynamics is we'd like to get an equation where the unknowns are all state properties. So that if I could go through and fix all my states, then I would know how to get the answer to my problem. So now how do I fix my states in this case? Right? So the answer lies in the fact that we're assuming that the turbine and the pump are isentropic. And we would have to do that in this problem unless they told us some more information. Right? So the thing about this 2S, right? this is engineering code for it's the isentropic outlet. And the word isentropic means that the specific entropy doesn't change. So how do we fix state two? We recognize that this is an isentropic process. So S2, S, is equal to S1. And now I know that my temperature is 10 degrees and my specific entropy is 5.7 degrees. So now I'd have to ask myself, okay, I'll go down and look at a table, right? And I'll look at a table that's a two-phase table with temperature of 10 degrees, and I'll see is this specific entropy between SF and SG. If it is, then that means I'm still under the vapor dome and I can find some quality. If it's not, because I'm coming out of a turbine and you never want liquid coming out of your turbine, you would not want subcooled liquid coming out of a turbine where steam was going in. So here, if it wasn't a two-phase mixture, you would probably assume that it was a superheated vapor. So this is exactly what we're going to do. We're going to look, this is the um, table, not from your textbook, for, from the FE exam, which you may or may not choose to write after you graduate. Or some people, I think, even write it in their senior year while, uh, while things are still fresh in their mind, right? So here we want to see if our value of S was between 0.151 and 8.9. And you'll find out in this case, S2 is 5.7, which is between those two numbers. So now what I do is I try to find out what my quality is. So I know that if I'm under the vapor dome, that quality at state 2 is equal to SF plus X2S multiplied by SFG. Now this table is nice because it gives us SFG. If I don't remember what that means, that's SG minus SF. So here, the only thing that I don't know is the quality at 2S. So I can use this to find the quality, and I see that it's just under 
64%. So that's good. And it kind of, um, it's consistent with my TS diagram, right? Because here, I know that this uh, vapor dome slopes outward, right? So here, if I'm going vertically down from this point, I was expecting to be under the vapor dome, just like I expect this state over here, which we haven't done yet, state three, I also expect this to be under the vapor dome. So let's see, if my quality X2 is 0.635, then I can use that information to find H2S. So I look at the same row, but now I'm gonna look at the information for the specific enthalpies. So H2S in this case is going to be HF plus X2S, which we just found, times HFG. I know all of this information, so I put it into my calculator, and I find that H2 is 1,614.6 kilojoules per kilogram. So I put that into my table. So this is good. Now I only need one more state to fix, right? So how do we fix state three? This is almost the same as how we fix state two, although I guess it's a little bit tricky because this is the inlet. It doesn't have that, it's not, this is not 3S, right? We had 4S, right, which was the isentropic outlet of this pump. But here, right, we have three, but it's the inlet of this isentropic process. So that meant that through the process, S4S was going to be the same as S3. So that's the same too, so I can put that in there, right? So now I have two independent intensive properties for state three as well. So I'm still on this row of my table. I'm gonna end up doing the same process I did before, but I have a different value of S. So now S3 is 3.25. So I can put this in and I can find X3, which in this case is 35.5%. That kind of makes sense too, because like we were saying, we expected this point to be under the vapor dome as well, because it's vertically right beneath this saturated liquid point, right? So that's gotta be over here. We're also expecting quality to decrease through the condenser, because that's the point of the condenser, right? So the point of the condenser is to condense that steam. So this makes sense. We're getting more liquid in our mixture. So our quality now is 0.3546. I can use that to find H3. Again, I'm using the same row on the table, and H3 is equal to HF plus X3 times HFG. Now before, I knew S3, and I was using this equation to find X3, but now I know X3, so I'm gonna use that to find H3. So I put this into my calculator, and I find that H3 is 920.5 kilojoules per kilogram. So now my state table is finished, right? So that's pretty good. Hopefully, um, hopefully it wasn't uh, too tricky to get here, right? We kind of tried to follow this systematic process. First, look for places where we know two independent intensive properties. And then when we only had one intensive property, we try to think about a process that that state touches and use information about that process to find our other state. In this case, the information that we knew was that it was an isentropic process to go from 1 to 2s and from 3 to 4s. So now I can go back to my thermal efficiency equation and I can put all the values in that I know. And I see, after doing some math that my th and some more math, that my thermal efficiency is about 50%. Physically, what this means is about half of the heat that we put into the system went to generating power, right? Now, I guess, you know, in some ways, because we're used to writing tests and things and we feel like you should be able to get up to 100% efficiency, but that's not true in this case, right? Because Calvin and Planck told us that in order to have a system like this that runs in a cycle, we need the heat engine to reject heat. So here, our heat sink, this means that half of the heat that we put in goes to cooling down or, or gets rejected as we cool down 
that steam inside our condenser. So there's a trick to this, right? So this was a Carnot engine, right? Because we assumed that the turbine and the pump were isentropic or ideal processes, right? So why not just use the Carnot efficiency equation, right? The Carnot efficiency equation tells us that one minus T out over T in is equal to the thermal efficiency for a Carnot engine, the best thermal efficiency we can get. Now, in this problem, I did some things that were a little bit non-physical. So as we went through the turbine, we, um, we were condensing liquid. You would prefer when you go through your turbine for that not to happen, because then as you're going through the turbine, if the steam is condensing, then it's making these little water droplets inside your turbine as these, you know, finely machined turbine blades are whipping around very, very fast. Um, then these small droplets of water are impinging on that blade and damaging the blade. So you would like to have vapor coming out of your turbine too. But the reason I did this is because I wanted the heat addition in the boiling. I wanted that to be all at one temperature. So I wanted that to go from a saturated liquid to a saturated vapor. Because then you see in this case, our temperature stayed constant at 300 degrees. I also wanted the condensation process to happen all at one temperature. So remember, we were under the vapor dome. And you would want your condenser for sure to take you all the way to liquid so that you weren't putting vapor into your pump. So this is, these states are not super um, realistic, but I just wanted to show you something. So the reason that I did that is because now we know that the heat addition the lowest temperature the heat addition can happen at is the maximum temperature in our system, right? And the highest temperature that the cold temperature can be is the lowest part in our system. So if we do that, we can think of our cold temperature, our T out, as being 10 degrees, and our hot temperature as being 300 degrees. Except that when I'm talking about degrees there, it's degrees Celsius, right? So remember, your spidey senses start tingling here these can't be in degrees Celsius because you're going to get a real different answer if one of these is zero and if one of them is 273. So we got to convert these temperatures from degrees Celsius, which the problem gave it to us, into degree Kelvin. So I add 273 to both numbers, right? And you can see here, you get a very different answer if you have 10 over 300 versus if you have 283 over 573. So now, right, so here I can see, because I'm rejecting heat at this cold space, and the cold space is not at absolute zero, I have to have some thermal efficiency that's below one, right? Because this term is not going to be zero. Another thing I can do is I can crank up this hot temperature as hot as I can, and that's going to make this number lower, right? It's going to make this fraction lower if I make the denominator zero. The problem is eventually you're going to get to a temperature where either you don't have a fuel you can burn that hot or you get so hot that you melt your equipment right so that's why before we said you know we want to have we want to make friends with chemical engineers that are good at making fuels and we want to be friends with materials engineers who are good at making high temperature steel steels right or some other metal so we put that into our equation and here we see that our thermal efficiency in the ideal case is 50.6%. So in this case, because I sort of contrived the problem a little bit so that the heat addition all happened at one temperature and the heat rejection all happened at one temperature, and then I picked those temperatures as my hot and cold temperatures, um, we end up with the exact same equation that we got, or the exact same answer that we got when we did all four components. So this was a little bit to show you how we can find thermal efficiency in two different ways. First, by using the first law to go component by component through our system. And second, if it's a Carnot engine or an ideal engine, then I can use this equation, which is much faster. And that gives me kind of the best case scenario given the parameters that I have, right? And in this case, the parameters are the temperature of my cold reservoir and the temperature of my hot reservoir. And in this case, 
again, because I kind of doctored the problem to be this way, we got the same number um, either way, right? The neat thing here, too, is that the latest video that I just put up on the course website talks about how to do a Rankine cycle analysis. But when we get there, you already know because we just did it here, right? So I'm kind of sneakily showing you how to do a Rankine cycle analysis. And hopefully that'll uh, pull us forward a little bit in the course. The one other thing that I wanted to say, if we go onto the My Courses webpage, there's a video that I'd like you to watch this weekend. I'm trying to get a little bit ahead of things so that we have more time when we start to look at all these cycles to, um, to sort of sit down and pause if we need to, if people have questions or if we want to have kind of a more um, kind of open session where we can ask questions and kind of go through things a little bit more slowly than we usually do. Because the cycle analysis stuff, it starts to feel a little bit like drinking from a fire hose sometimes because we go through the different cycles very quickly. So the, the video that I just put up is still in this same week. You'll notice that there's four and then there's one video and it talks about um, how to find, how to fix entropy and, or how to fix specific entropy in different cases. Now, a lot of this you already know, right? Like we did this time. So some of this is, oh, if you have a uh, saturated vapor, how do you find S? Or a saturated liquid, how do you find S? Right? Or if you're under the vapor dome, how do you find S? So a lot of this you've seen already. It's just now we're interpolating with S instead of H. But there are a couple things that are a little bit different. Like when we go through a real pump from um, saturated liquid to saturated liquid, we find delta S a little bit differently. And in particular, when we deal with ideal gases, there are some different equations. So that lecture is broken up into two parts. I think in total, it's about half an hour. The first 15 minutes are kind of different ways to fix the state. And the last 15 minutes are an example problem. So I'll send out an email, but please have a look at that video over the weekend. And then we'll be, uh, we'll be ready to go for the next part uh, on Monday. Um, next week's a short week too. So I think RIT is observing the 4th of July on Friday next week. So we will move our Friday lecture to Thursday. So I'll send out an announcement about that as well. Does anyone have any questions? All right, well, thank you for your time.